The British forces are finally coming to Hell at Loose, and the two new maps we are getting with them are El Alamein and a map set in Holland. In this video, I'm going to run through the infantry weapons the British are likely to get, and I'll discuss why their 1942 equipment will be different to the gear they should have in 1944. To stop this video from getting too long, I'm going to make a separate video on the different tanks we can expect to see for those maps. Before I jump into this list, it should be noted that Team 17 have stated a desire to keep things historically accurate in terms of weapon, vehicle and uniform availability on the different maps. This means that the dates of the battles that the two maps are based on will determine what kind of equipment which should be available. In Team 17's latest roadmap Q&A, they said, while covering one year of the war for each game calendar year, we want to ensure we are keeping the player experience historically accurate and are working on ways in which we can determine loadouts, vehicles and cosmetics are only applicable to specific maps while keeping the gameplay experience fun and engaging. So Team 17 appear to be leaning more towards historical accuracy, which I think is great because having the correct weapons and vehicles on the appropriate maps will allow the new content to properly showcase different periods and theatres of the war. Different parts of the war depicted in the game will have their own look and feel and I really like this approach. This isn't just cool from the perspective of those Held at Loose fans who appreciate a reasonable level of historical accuracy, but also allows the early or mid-war maps which are added to the game to play differently than the late war maps we already have. This is because there should be different weapons and vehicles available during the different periods of the conflict. This level of detail and variety between the different maps and theatres of World War II will, in my opinion, offer a richer and more engaging gaming experience rather than just lazily copy and pasting the late world equipment we already have onto earlier battlefields. If all the maps had the same weapons and vehicles, it would get boring really quickly and it would erode that sense of immersion and semi-realism which we really love about Hell at Loose. That's long enough of an intro, so what do we know about these two new maps coming with the British in June? The first map has been revealed as El Alamein. In mid and late 1942, this area in Egypt, near a railway junction, was the site of two key battles in the Western Desert Campaign. I'm going to assume Team 17 will depict the second battle of El Alamein, which kicked off in October 1942. The primary belligerents were the British Commonwealth forces fighting against the German Africa Corps forces. Of course, I should point out that the Italian forces were heavily involved on the Axis side, but sadly, they aren't being added to Held at Loose just yet. Hopefully, we'll see them in the game in the not-too-distant future. The second map hasn't officially been named by Team 17, but they hinted that it will be set in the rolling hills of Holland. This means it will be almost certainly an Operation Market Garden map, which will be set in September 1944 when the Allies attempted an airborne operation to secure the crossings over the River Rhine. That means that the two maps are set two years apart. Between late 1942 and late 1944, both the British and Germans would introduce more advanced weaponry and vehicles to the battlefields, so if Team 17 are keeping it historically accurate, the loadout and vehicle rosters in 1942 and 1944 should not be identical for either the Brits or the Germans. So first, let's look at the infantry weapons that should be available on the El Alamein map. Commanders and officers in Held at Loose start with a submachine gun in their first standard issue loadout. In 1942, at the battles of El Alamein, the most widely used submachine gun in Montgomery's British 8th Army was the American Thompson M1928 submachine gun, which was available with either the stick or drum magazines. The iconic British Sten gun, which was much cheaper alternative to the American Thompson, had been rapidly developed in 1940 and put into production by 1941, but I haven't been able to find any evidence of its use at the Battle of El Alamein. However, the Sten was used elsewhere in North Africa by British paratroopers during Operation Torch, which was a successful Anglo-American operation to occupy Vichy-controlled Morocco and Algeria. That operation started in November 1942, just as the fierce Second Battle of El Alamein was coming to a close. So I think British commanders, officers, assault players and recon squad leaders should definitely get the Thompson M1928. However, it's not clear to me whether they should have access to the Sten on this particular map. Please let me know in the comments if you know whether or not the Brits used the Sten gun at El Alamein. The German commander, squad leader, assault and recon squad leaders should have access to the MP38 or MP40. A cool, realistic alternative for the submachine gun for the Germans on this map would be the Italian Beretta Model 38. This was an excellent submachine gun which was very popular among German units during World War II and since the Italians were literally fighting alongside the Germans at El Alamein, it wouldn't be a stretch for them to get access to the Beretta 38 as another loadout option for the roles that use the submachine gun. 
when it comes to the main battle rifle for the British and German forces, the primary weapon for the rifleman, support, medic, anti-tank and engineer roles will be variants of the Lee Enfield for the British and the Car 98 for the Germans. Both are bolt action rifles, but the Lee Enfield has an advantage since it has a 10 round magazine fed by 5 round stripper clips while the Car 98 only has a 5 round magazine. At the battles of El Alamein, neither side had a semi-automatic rifle. Throughout 1941 and 1942, the German arms industry had been developing a semi-automatic rifle, there were prototypes developed, and a competition between Walther and the Mauser companies would eventually be won by Walther. After troop trials, the Walther rifle was formally adopted by the military as the Gewehr 41, the German army's first semi-automatic rifle, but this did not happen until December 1942, too late for the battles of El Alamein. So no semi-automatic rifles should be available in the German loadouts. This includes the FG-42, which is available in Hell at Loose for the automatic rifleman class and one of the sniper loadouts. Although prototypes were being tested in 1942, the FG-42 were not going to full production until 1943, which again is after the Battle of El Alamein. From my research, it seems that the FG-42 was first used in combat in 1943. When it comes to the automatic rifleman class, the obvious choice for the British is the Bren gun. Based on an excellent Czechoslovakian design, the Bren light machine gun had a 30 round magazine and it fired the same powerful 303 cartridge as the Lee Enfield rifle. If Team 17 are being strictly historically accurate, on the El Alamein map, the German automatic rifleman class should not have access to the SG-44. Its predecessor, the MKB-42, was still a prototype at this time and it mostly saw testing on the Eastern Front. The SDG-44 wouldn't even begin development until 1943 and production wouldn't start until later that year or early 1944. In place of the SDG-44, the German automatic rifleman will most likely get an MP40, but Team 17 could give the automatic rifleman an Italian Breda Model 30 light machine gun for one of the loadouts. This was an Italian light machine gun designed in the 1920s which had a unique fixed magazine on the right side of the weapon which opened on a hinge to allow a 20 round stripper clip to reload the weapon. Again, since the Italians fought alongside the Germans, it wouldn't be outrageous for Team 17 to give the Africa Corps troops access to the Beretta Model 30 as an alternative to the SDG-44. It wasn't a very good light machine gun and it had a slow rate of fire and performed badly in the dusty and sandy conditions of North Africa as it was prone to malfunction, but it could be included as a substitute for the SDG-44 in this scenario. When it comes to the machine gunner role, the Brit starting loadout should probably be the World War I vintage Vickers heavy machine gun. This water-cooled, belt-fed MG would have to be a fixed deployable with a tripod as it was too heavy to be carried by one man like the American 30 cal Browning or the German MG34. Another option for the British MG loadout could be the Lewis gun. This World War I era light machine gun had a 47 round pan magazine and was still in use across the British Empire during World War II and it did see action in North Africa. A third lineup for the British MG role could feature the Brent gun. Now the German machine gun role should get the MG34 as well as the gun that was intended to replace it, the cheaper and quicker to produce MG42. The MG42 first saw action in North Africa as it was deployed with the Africa Corps in May of 1942. These troops were the first in the German army to use Hitler's buzzsaw, as it was nicknamed by the Allies. Moving on to the anti-tank weapons, which should be available in 1942, for both sides it's all about anti-tank rifles and deployable anti-tank guns. In 1942, the Brits were still relying on the boys' anti-tank rifle. This was a bolt-action .55 caliber rifle with a 5 round magazine. It should be the first anti-tank loadout for the Brits. In the early part of World War II, the boys' anti-tank rifle was already kind of obsolete as it was only effective at very close range against some of the lighter German tanks. But as the war progressed and German tank armour improved, as new heavier tanks rolled out of the factories, the boys' anti-tank rifle lost its ability to take on tanks. However, it was still adequate against fixed targets such as enemy pillboxes, machine gun nests or light vehicles like trucks and half-tracks. It was the boys' anti-tank rifle's shortcomings which led to the development of the Projector, comma, Infantry, comma, Anti-Tank Weapon, or PIAT for short. But I'll discuss that weapon in more detail when we move to the Holland map, which was set in 1944, as the Piat wasn't produced and used in combat until 1943. The first loadout for the German anti-tank role should feature their own anti-tank rifle, the Panzer Buxer 39, or PZB 39 for short. This was a single shot breech loading anti-tank rifle, which had two cases containing 10 rounds attached to the sides of the weapon near the breech. 
the Germans would not develop their Panzerschreck rocket launcher until 1943, so again, that should not be present on the El Alamein map. The gun crew loadout for the British should get the 6 pounder gun, which replaced their 2 pounder as the primary anti tank gun for the British Army during World War II. The 6 pounder was introduced to the battlefield in North Africa in the spring of 1942, so just before the events of El Alamein. This also happens to be the same gun which is currently in the game as the American 57mm M1 anti tank gun. After seeing how effective the British 6 pounder was in North Africa, in the spring of 1943, the United States Army introduced a copy of the 6 pounder as the 57mm M1 to replace its smaller 37mm M3 as its primary anti tank weapon. Now, the German gun crew loadout should use the Panzer Abwehr Kanone 38 or PAC 38, a 50mm anti tank gun which was issued to the German army from late 1940 to replace the 37mm PAC 36. After the experience of the first year of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, which started in June 1941, the Germans noticed that their Pac-38s weren't able to easily knock out KV-1s or T-34s, so development of a more powerful anti-tank gun, which was already in the works, was sped up. By 1942, around 1,300 of the more powerful 7.5cm Pac-40 anti-tank guns had been produced and were issued first to the Eastern Front. The Pac-40 is the current anti-tank gun available to the Germans in Held at Loose. More than 20,000 were built by 1945, making it the most common German anti-tank gun of World War II. I could not find any evidence that Pac-40s were used at El Alamein. The Germans and the Italians had suffered supply problems in the run-up to the battle, which affected the delivery of things like fuel as well as hardware. So while it is possible that they had some Pac-40s, it is guaranteed that they had Pac-38s. But another tank killer that they did have at El Alamein was the famous Flak 88 cannons. They were initially developed during World War I as anti-aircraft weapons, but would be improved over the years, even developing artillery and anti-tank rounds for the 88s, in a series which included the original Flak 18s, 36s, 37s and 41s. It would be cool if German engineers could build Flak 88s in the game, but these would need to be crewed by at least two or three people to use efficiently. Currently in the game, anti-tank guns can be operated by one player, although you have to switch between the gunner and loader, which takes more times between shots, and it's obviously a lot slower to traverse the gun from side to side with just one player. If Team 17 were to introduce 88s, they should design it so that it needs more than one player to turn, load and fire the weapon in any effective manner. I actually doubt Team 17 will add a flak of 88s, as it would give the Germans too much of an advantage unless the Americans, Brits and Soviets got their own deployable weapon with similar firepower. The British sniper, of course, should have a scoped Lee Enfield, while the Germans should get a scoped Kahn anti-8. As I said earlier, the FG-42 had not been developed by the time of the Battle of El Alamein, so the Germans should not have access to it as a scoped weapon for one of their sniper loadouts. When it comes to flamethrowers, the German army had used them from the outset of the war. I was able to find a photo dated to 1941 from the siege of Tobruk which shows German troops armed with flame and weapons, but I could not find any more information as to whether they were used at the Battle of El Alamein. But the Germans definitely had that equipment. The British, on the other hand, never really got into man portable flamethrowers. A flamethrower portable number 2 Mark I was developed in 1941 and was hastily adopted but was soon withdrawn from service in 1943 because of design flaws. Namely, the initial ignition system was unreliable and the fuel pressure valve was all clearly placed, which made turning on in the heat of battle a bit difficult for the user. It was redesigned and a Mark II version was produced in time for the Normandy landings in 1944. So it is possible that the Germans did have manned portable flamethrowers available at the Battle of El Alamein, but the British probably didn't. Please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Let's move away from North Africa and the Egyptian desert in 1942 and turn to the Lush Hills of Holland, which will be the second map for the British, set in September 1944. What are the main differences for infantry equipment for both sides? Well, by 1944 the Sten gun is in much wider use across the British Army, especially for the British paratroopers who were involved in Operation Market Garden. So it should become the primary submachine gun for the Brits, and the M1928 Thompson should now become the secondary submachine gun loadout. The British boys anti-tank rifle should still be available as one of the AT loadouts, but the new anti-tank weapon of choice for the British should be the Piat. This man-portable anti-tank weapon was based on a spigot mortar design and was developed in 1942 and introduced to the front lines in 1943, so not in time for El Alamein, but it was certainly in use during Operation Market Garden. 
Unlike the American Bazooka or the German Panzer Trek, which used a small rocket to propel their warheads, the Piat used a combination of a massive spring and a blank cartridge, similar to those used in rifle grenades. Because of this mechanism, the Piat's warhead was slower moving than the Bazooka rocket, and its projectile had a less of a direct trajectory than the Bazooka. But the slower moving warhead did not affect the armor penetration because the Piat's warhead was using a shape charge. As long as the charge hit the enemy tank at a good angle, that shape charge could penetrate much thicker armor than the boy's anti-tank rifle could ever hope to achieve. Anti-tank rifles rely on their speed of the projectile to defeat the armor, but the Piat's shape charge did the work by defeating armor, not the speed of the warhead. The Piat had an effective range of about 100 meters, but could fire as far as 300 meters in an indirect fire roll. So you could see the Piat used like a mortar, looping shots over cover at enemies opposed to direct fire. By September 1943, the Germans had also upgraded their anti-tank capabilities, and the Panzerschreck should be available for their anti-tank players having been developed in 1943. For any Operation Market garden maps, the Germans should have access to their semi-automatic Gewehr 43, which was an upgraded Gewehr 41, as well as their STG 44 and the FG 42. By this period of the war, those guns were in production and had been issued to troops. When it comes to sidearms and grenades, the standard British and Commonwealth sidearm was the Enfield No. 2 revolver, a top break revolver which had a six round cylinder. It had been adopted in 1932. But because of demand during World War II, the older Webley revolvers, which had been in service since 1887, also saw a lot of action. This also had six shots and was a top break design. The standard issue grenade from the start of the war was the Mills Bomb, a fragmentation grenade first developed in World War I. Another grenade, not available at El Alamein, but used in Operation Market Garden, was the British Gammon Bomb. Developed in 1943, this consisted of an elasticized bag filled with an amount of plastic explosives which the user could determine and a fuse. Troops could fill the bag with as much plastic explosives as they needed, remove the screw crap and throw it at the intended target. It would arm whilst being thrown and explode immediately upon impact. It could therefore be used as a hand grenade if filled with a small amount of plastic explosives or if filled with a lot more, it could be used to knock out larger targets like enemy vehicles. So, guys, that is my rundown of the possible weapons which we could see for the El Alamein and Holland map. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favour and smash the like button, share the video and drop me a comment letting me know which British weapons you are most looking forward to trying out. I'll be making another video soon about the different tanks we can expect with the British and Germans on these two maps, so subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on that.